Uh, my name's Monica Bergler. Um, I've been coaching Code Busters at the C and B level for like five or six years now. I can't remember. Um, so when they started this as an event, a trial event last year, um, I was happy to be the supervisor for this. Uh, my son Logan also helps me out. Um, he actually did um, Code Busters in the high school level, uh, um, but he said he won't be able to join us today. Um, but we're going to go over all the rules, a little bit about the different ciphers that the students need to learn, and um, what's the best way to coach this event. It is a fun event. I think your kids will enjoy it. I know last year the trial event went really well. Um, so I, I think uh, I think you'll find this a, a fun event. All right, so again, we're gonna uh, I'm gonna introduce some terms that you're gonna need to know. Um, we're gonna go over the rules, the different codes, and again, how to how to coach for this and where you can find some tools to help you. And then we'll take questions at the end. If you do have a question about a certain cipher, go ahead and, and speak up, um, or you can just wait until the end at the question session. Okay, first up, some uh, definitions that you might see um, if you're reading up on how to do ciphers. Um, the kids don't need to know these by heart or anything. They don't get tested on them, but again, it's just for you to know when someone's talking what they're referring to. So if someone says plain text or unencoded, um, basically that's just the English language or the Spanish language or the German language. It's it's normal uh, grammar and, and speak, uh, you know, text. Uh, the cipher text or encoded text is just the letters that don't make any sense that they need to try to figure out what they mean. A key is basically information used to encrypt the plain text. So there's certain ciphers that you will be giving a key to solve because there's no way to solve it without the key. Um, one example is the Visionaire cipher. Uh, you will always be giving a key to help break that code. Uh, decryption or decrypt is converting the ciphertext to the plain text. Um, and this can be done with or without a key, depending on the cipher, but that's what the kids are going to be doing. They're, they're decrypting ciphers. Um, a crib is um, basically a little hint on where some of the plain text is given to the students uh, to help them solve the problem. Um, a decryption table is a table used for that specific cipher uh, to solve the problem. So, for instance, again, Visioneer has a certain table that the kids will be given to help them decode that. Um, now, there are some ciphers that need a table that the kids will need to know how to create that table, but some of them are given, and I'll go over that as we talk about each cipher. And then cipher analysis is analyzing the, the text to determine the key and then decrypting. Um, that's not something in division A uh, that they really do too much. So that one you don't have to worry about. Um, but that's something at the higher levels that they do do. Okay, so the, the rules. So basically students are tested on their ability to decode encrypted messages using cryptic analysis techniques and show skills with ciphers by decrypting a message. So basically they're solving puzzles. Um, that's how I, I refer to them a lot um, with the kids. Um, and if, if you have a student that, you know, really likes to, to solve things and, and try to, you know, they, they can see out of, out of the box, then they're usually good um, with a lot of these codes. You can have up to two students on the team. I do recommend having two. Uh, I have had students last year that were by themselves and, and some of them did really well. Um, so it's not that you can't do it. Um, it's just hard. It's, it's the tests are written um, where you won't finish them. Um, and, and there's a reason for that because um, we want the kids to be able to pick and choose which ciphers they want to do. And there is some strategy involved in that. Um, but even at the high school and junior high level, the tests are, are 
more than what they can finish in the allotted time. So let your students know that so they don't feel bad at the end if they're like, oh, I only got, you know, part of the test done. That's normal. No one finishes the test. The only thing that they need are pencils and erasers. Um, I do recommend bringing a couple pencils just in case something breaks. Um, and a really good eraser is, is very helpful because um, they will be part of solving these is sometimes guessing at something. And if it's not right, you need to erase it. Um, other than that, they don't need anything else. Um, but please make sure they have those. Um, I had a lot of students last year show up without pencils. Um, and so we had to scramble and try to find some for them. Um, and they can, uh, when they get the test, they can answer the questions in any order. Um, the tests usually come in a folder. They're single-sided and they're not stapled together. So they can work on different problems separately. And, and I recommend that um, so they can do it any way they want. And again, there's some strategy to that that we'll go over later. Okay, um, basically high score wins. Uh, each cipher is awarded certain points and it's, it, 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 each one will show how many points it's worth. You see the example on the bottom, this particular cipher is worth 21 points. Now, the way we do this at the elementary level is that each letter of a cipher is worth so many points depending on the cipher, it can change because some are easier and some are harder. And then if they finish the whole cipher, there's kind of like a little bonus points added in there. So finishing one, um, you're, you're getting a little extra boost there. Um, and again, points values are clearly indicated. Um, and again, the easier the cipher, the lower the points. So this year, there are um, the same ciphers we had last year, but we added one. So we have the at bash, which is probably the easiest one. Um, the Caesar, the aristocrat, aristocrats are the hardest ones. Um, and those are ones that if they continue this on in junior high and high school, they will see those. Um, Visioneer, pig pen, which is also called the Masonic tap code, and then the new one is called Dancing Man. And we'll go over each of those now. So at bash, like I said, is the easiest um, cipher. Um, I would probably give these to like the younger kids on your team. Um, basically, the alphabet is reversed. So A equals Z, B equals Y, C equals X, and so on. The table that I'm showing you up here is given to them in the, the packet for their test. So all they have to do is look at this table and match up the letters. Um, so again, very easy. They're usually not worth a lot of points, but they can be done quickly. And again, it's a good starting point to get them going and feeling confident in solving um, some of these puzzles. Um, so again, there's, there's not a lot of really solving in this because you're given the problem or you're given the table and you just have to look at the table to see what the letters equal. The next one is a Caesar. Um, this one also is considered um, an easier one. Um, basically what it is is this the alphabet has been shifted either left or right um, and for division A they can only shift it one to five characters. Um, so, for example, if if the word was Caesar and I shifted it by one, C would now equal D, A would now equal B, B would equal F, et cetera. So sometimes they're told how much it's shifted, um, but other times they're not, and they have to figure out how much it's shifted. And there's there's different ways to test that. Um, but again, these are usually um, lower points, especially if they're told how much it's been shifted. Um, and again, the limit is five, either shifted five up or five back. Um, so they limit that at the division A level. 
The next one is aristocrat. Again, this is the hardest one that they're going to have to do. And this is the one that you see most often, like in newspapers and in puzzle books and stuff like that. It's a monoalphabetic substitution. So it's a random alphabet. No letter can be mapped to itself. And a hint may be provided depending on the level of difficulty. So to solve these, they're really looking at, um, you're, they're given a frequency table. And so you use that a lot. So they need to know like what letters of the alphabet are most frequently used. So like E is the most frequent letter in the alphabet. So usually I tell the kids start with that. If, if, if in the frequency table, if it's showing that a certain letter is more, is showing up more than any other letter, that's a good indication that is probably E. It's not always, but it's probably E, and they could do that. Um, there are other some there are some other ways to solving aristocrats. And later on, when I go over um, how to coach it, I'll give you some links um, to information on how to to go about doing the aristocrats because there's certain things that they should look for. But again, these are going to be the hardest. They're going to be worth the most points um, but I've last year during the trial event I saw that for the younger kids these were really difficult um, because you really have to have a grasp of um, grammar and spelling because that will sometimes give you hints on what words are going to be um, so if you have a student that is younger and, and maybe not a strong speller um, these are going to be difficult for them so I wouldn't I wouldn't have them working on those. I would probably have them working on a different type of problem. Okay, the veneer. This is a standard substitution cipher with a key. So again, you're going to get be given a key with this one. Um, they're going to use this table that is shown, and this table is given to them, and it looks a little intimidating, but it's pretty easy to use once you know how to use the the table. Basically, when they get the key, they need to write the key on top of the letters of the um, the cipher text and make sure that they don't skip any spaces. So each each letter of the cipher text will have one letter of the key above it. And then you use the key letter as the row in the table and the cipher letter as the column, and then you you find what the decrypted letter is. Um, the most common mistake is skipping letters when copying the key or looking up the wrong column um, to get the um, to get this information. So again, once they know how to use this table, it's a fairly easy um, cipher. It's just time consuming because you have to look up each letter. The next is the pig pen or Masonic. Um, this one is your your coding symbols, um, which map to a, a letter. So this one, they have to learn how to create these tables. These tables are not given to them. Um, so basically the first table is a tic-tac-toe and then you put the letters in. And then the second one is tic-tac-toe, but you have those dots and then you have the X and then the X with the dots. The problem I've seen with kids recreating these is with the X's and putting the letters in the wrong order. Um, so make sure that they realize that it doesn't go clockwise. Um, it goes top, left, right, bottom. Because um, once they can fill, you know, create that, then the creating or solving the cipher is, is relatively easy. If you see at the bottom, you know, it has the little symbols and underneath what those are. So like a, a square is E. And again, if the kids are doing these, you know, they'll start knowing what the symbols are without having to look at the charts and that makes it go faster too. Um, but this one's, you know, a fun one, um, relatively quick, they just got to know how to create this chart. All right, 
the tab code is another one that they have to be able to create the chart. So it's a five by five chart and they just fill in the alphabet, but they have to know that C and K share the same spot. Um, so that's the tricky part of creating this. And then basically they're gonna be given rows of dots and they're gonna take them in chunks of two and that's how you're gonna decode these problems. So like if, if it's a dot, dot, it's an A, but a dot and then five dots, so you got one and then five is an E. And they just go through solving the problem that way. The problem I've seen with this one where people make mistakes is that they, they sometimes don't um, group the dots properly. Sometimes like if it's a dot, dot, and then there's a, um, and there's enough space that you can kind of see when it changes. Um, but I've seen sometimes where they'll, they'll put um, two groups together that aren't supposed to be together. So they have to just really look at the, the gap between those dots um, to know when, when it's, changing over to the next group. The new one here is called Dancing Men. Um, this table is given to them. So it'll look just like this with all the little men. Uh, the, this up here is A through Z, and then these are numbers. And basically the, the code is gonna be a bunch of these little guys and they have to look up the guys and find out what letter it pertains to. Um, so again, it can be time consuming to look them all up. Um, I always recommend if you have a student that is going to be doing these is that they should memorize the most common letters, um, just so they, they don't always have to look those up. So how do you, how do you coach for this event? Um, the biggest thing is practice. Um, they have to get used to solving these problems. Um, and, the, and the only way to do that is with pen and paper and doing them. Um, like I said, try to put two students on the team, but if you have a, you know, someone that's really strong um, and, and quick at solving these, one student could do it. Um, they wanna divide and conquer. So they wanna split up the test. So they each should be working on a problem. Um, no one should ever be sitting there um, waiting for something to happen. There's always gonna be enough for them to do. So they should always be working on something. Now they can talk to each other if they get stuck and they're not sure, you know, they can talk to each other and say, hey, can you look at this? Do you see something I'm not seeing? Um, that's fine, but they really shouldn't both be working on the same problem. Um, they need to learn the pig pen and tap code tables. Uh, maybe have each kid learn one of them uh, so they don't, you know, they don't have to learn, you know, more than one and make it their responsibility uh, to know how to create that table. And once they create it, you know, there might be more than one pig pen um, problem on there, you know, they don't have to create it again. You know, they can look back at what they did. Um, they are usually given a scrap, a piece of scrap paper. So I recommend creating those tables on the scrap paper so that it's available when they go to the next problem. Um, sometimes if you're stuck, you just gotta try something, especially with an aristocrat. Sometimes just putting some things in there that you think might work will show you um, you know, that you're on the right path or it'll show you real quick that no, that's not gonna work. Um, because sometimes I see kids just sitting there staring at the problem and it's better just to try something um, and then erase it if it doesn't work. Um, learn pattern words. What this means is there's certain words that have patterns like the word that, you know, it's um, a one, two, three, one pattern. So I tell kids, if you see a four letter word that the, the first and the last letter are the same thing, it's most likely gonna be the word that. It's not always, but most likely it is. So 
give that a try and see how it goes. Um, there are some other ones that um, are common too, like the word people, the word success, the word science, um, you know, little. And again, it's, it's those ones that have words that are letters that repeat. Um, but if they learn to see those patterns, um, they'll be able to solve some of these problems quicker. Um, and then you got to figure out what works best for your team. Um, do you have someone try to do, you know, one high point question, or is it better to do five low point questions? Um, and again, it depends on your team. Maybe you have one student that does the, the lower point questions, and then you have another student that tries for the higher point ones, because obviously the higher point questions are going to take longer, so they're not going to get as many done. Um, so you have to decide on, you know, what what's the strong suit for your students, um, or do they tr try to do all the the low point ones and then they they work together to try to do a high point one. Um, so again, this is a strategy that you got to come up with with what works best for your team. What I recommend coaching wise is I would start with the at bash and the Caesar. Again, those are the easiest ones. It'll give the kids some confidence in solving them. Um, and then go to the pig pen, the tap code, and the dancing men. They're all kind of similar because they all have a chart that you have to refer to. Again, the pig pen and tap code, they have to learn how to make those charts. Um, but again, once they kind of know it's a you know symbol substitution, then they can kind of get those done pretty quickly. Um, the visioneer, I would do after those, um, just because it's different. Um, but again, learning that chart and how to use that chart, once they understand how to use that, that, that problem, you know, is easy to solve too. And then the aristocrats, again, those are the hardest ones. Um, those are going to be the biggest points. So if you do have someone that, you know, really wants to do those, um, you know, have them give them a try. Um, those are the ones that you really need to practice because the more you do those, uh, the more you start seeing patterns, the more you start seeing, you know, what worked before. Um, it, it, it helps you guess more um, logically um, the more you do them. Um, and again, those are ones that if, if the kids are planning on doing science, so later on, um, those are the ones that they'll see at the junior high and high school level also, um, just harder. So, you know, if they really are into this, I would, you know, have them do those, but those are definitely the harder ones. Okay, some resources for you. So the Macomb Science Olympiad website, um, there are some sample tests out there that I created last year. Um, and there are some video resources on how to do the different ciphers. Um, so I highly recommend watching those if you're not sure how to, to do that and print out those sample tests um, when your students are ready and, and you know, give them a test run on how to, how to do these. Uh, also, there's a Science Olympiad Code Busters um, page, the links there. This one I use a lot. Um, it has a lot of information on how to solve the different ciphers. Um, it has a lot of practice tests from the last five years. Now, some of them are division B and C, but um, you might be able to find some questions that you can use, but you can also create your own test. Um, it's very easy to do on this website. Um, so you can go out there and just, you know, create a, you know, a test of just you know, visioneer questions while you're working on those. Um, you can, you know, start mixing them up and, and, you know, as you go, add different ones. Um, so I definitely recommend that website. Um, and then that's, that's kind of it with that. Is there any questions? I think I need to go over. I know we're running. I know there. I know. Last year, I did a in-person workshop for the students to go over how to solve all these. I and we, we plan on doing that again this year. 
um, where I'll go more in depth on how to, to solve each of these um, types of problems. Um, Um, I know somebody asked, um, is the presentation going to be sent out? Um, they will post this recording and my uh, slideshow on the website, um, the Macomb uh, website under the Code Busters. So uh, you will get that. Um, So yeah, so again, the, the presentation will be up. And I know last year's presentation is up there also. And it was pretty much the same. Like I said, we added dancing men, but everything else has been the same. So any of the information that's already on the Codebuster site um, is pretty inclusive. Um, it's just the dancing men that um, is not there. Um, Hi, can I ask a question? Sure. I don't know how to raise my hand on here. Yeah, no, I know. I see people raising their hand. I'm like, I'm not sure how to click on that. So yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, I was just curious, how is this related to real life um, careers? Because I know Science Olympiad, a lot of this stuff goes on into something they might want to pursue as a career. Um, I'm just curious. I've never done code busting, so just curious so I can kind of tell my girls, you know. Yeah, this anyway, actually relates to the like computer science because um, later on some of the harder ones um, you're going to get into um, like um, ones called Biconian, which is, um, you know, um, you know, ones and O's, which is computer code. Um, so that's kind of how this relates. It gets you to start thinking um, in, in terms of, you know, you might not see the problem, but you got to work it out um, and, and um, you know, use some logic to try to solve what is happening. Um, so they do, this one is kind of, they, they kind of put it under the, like for the computer um, people, <laughs> you know, people that are interested in that. But it really is just, it gets you to think logically and think outside the box um, where, where the answer might not be obvious, but you have to you know, use some logic and deduction to try to solve the problems. Now, some of these at the A level are, are you know, obviously gonna be easier because you're just using a table and looking things up. But I know like in the, the junior high and high school ones, um, they are much more um, where you have to use logic or there's math based ones and, and things like that. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question also. Yes. Um, how often, we're all new to this too, um, how often do we, um, should we meet with the kids? Is it like once a week and then let them work on some stuff at home or? That's what I do. Um, I usually have okay. weekly meetings. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll introduce one thing at a time. Um, and then, you know, the, when I, or when I do the next thing, you know, if I do like at bash, I might do at bash and Caesar together cause they're, they're kind of easy, but then the next time okay. I might just give them a test of those just to see, you know, did they retain what we talked about and then introduce the next one and then have a test with okay. the next three and just kind of build up from there. Okay. But yeah, once a week is plenty and then just, you know, have them work on something, you know, maybe have some printouts to give them to work on at home. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question. Um, so I know you mentioned that the kids, uh, when they're like actually in the test, um, we've done this before. We've done some other events. And in those events, the kids were not allowed to talk to each other. They had to silently kind of point and communicate. Can they talk to each other in the test? Yeah, they can talk to each other. Um, okay. Obviously, they don't want to talk really loud because they don't, you know, you don't want to give hints to anybody around you. Um, yeah. 
But yeah, um, you are allowed to talk. Okay. And then I also, I had been on um, your, the McComb site already kind of looking at the practice test you had. Is that about how long the test is or are these going to be much longer? They're going to be probably longer. I think last year, I think what I did is I had, I think I had like two of each kind. And then I think the aristocrats, I had a couple extra. Um, but I have to look back at last year's and see like, how close people got to finishing the test. Cause again, I, I don't want, I, I want extra on there. Um, so I might add a few more cause like, again, we have dancing man this year. So it's going to be probably a little longer than it was last year, but figure two to three questions per cipher. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And I, is it the, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. It's okay. Is it the test last for 30 minutes at the event? I say about 25 because I get a 30 minute time slot and I need a little bit of time to, you know, explain the rules. Um, so I usually give the students 25 minutes to take the test and they will be taking the test the whole 25 minutes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Where can we find the information for the workshops and what times and days? Um, I am not sure I would guess it would be on the uh, website. Um, I know John usually posts that stuff. Um, I'm, um, I'm can sure, can I, I interrupt I'm, real fast? Yeah, go ahead. Because it is it is on the website and I'm trying to look up the date right now okay. for the code bus. Okay, I have, we haven't been that far. Thank you. It's it's Tuesday, February 6. The code buster workshop is six o'clock. It's at MISD room number 100 ABC South entrance. Do you want me to repeat that? Nope, she's writing it down right now. Thank you, thank you, okay. thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, and I'll be I'll be running that workshop. Um, and again, that one I'll actually create a test and we'll will together go, go through how to solve these problems. So I'll go through my logic on like, how am I solving this? What am I thinking? You know, um, especially with the aristocrats. Um, and then there'll be some extra problems that they'll get to. And if you can't make the workshop, we do um, load that test up to the website. And I can't, I can't remember if they recorded it last year or not, but, um, but it is, a, it, I think it's a good workshop um, just to give the kids some practice with it. So if you can make it, I would do it. Any other questions? I have one um, yeah. and maybe this was answered or it will be answered probably at the workshop. Oh, I, I lost you there. Like at our senior. Oh, sorry. Um, are the questions for the reason? The symbols would obviously. Oh, you keep going Can you in. Can you hear me now? No, I, you keep going in and out. Sorry, I haven't been. If you want, you can type it in the chat and then maybe I can answer it that way. I, I'm waiting for that. Is there any other questions? I did have another one. Yes. Is there a way that we can be taught how to make up our own tests in case the ones that you provided aren't enough for our students and we want to make up more? I Yes, that the one website um, on the last slide, let me bring that slide back up. Hold on. Um, the, this, this Tobias one here, um, if you go there, there is um, 
a way to create your own test. And on the, on the Macomb website, we do have a link to a video on how to use that website. Um, but I use that all the time. That's how I create all my tests for division A, B, and C. You can go in there, type in your own um, quotes and tell it what type of cipher you want it to be. And it, it prints the whole packet out for you. Um, it's, it's a great, great website for this event. Um, so definitely go check that out um, and start. And when you create the test, they say it saves to your, um, to your computer. Um, so no one else can see them, but they do have, like I said, other tests out there um, that you can use too. And I, there's a few division A's, but this is kind of new for the division A. Um, it's mostly B and C out there right now, but you can create your own there. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. What is the difference between division A, B and C like you were mentioning? Like well, division A is elementary. Um, okay. B is middle school and C is high school. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. If you do later on, if you do have questions, um, I know you can submit um, questions on the website and um, it'll get to me to answer or just bring them uh, to the workshop on February um, 6th and I can answer them then. So um, good luck with your teams this year. Um, I'm sure the kids will enjoy this event. I, I We've had nothing but good um, responses uh, to this event. So, um, but good luck to y'all.